नमस्कार एंड वेलकम टू इंडियन डिप्लोमेसी शो ऑन दूरदर्शन इंडिया नेशनल टेलीविजन चैनल अबाउट इंडिया फॉरन पॉलिसी इंडिया मेजर स्ट्रेटेजिक पार्टनरशिप्स अराउंड द वर्ल्ड एंड इंडिया कॉन्ट्रीब्यूशन टू ग्लोबल गुड इन द फॉर्म ऑफ इकोनॉमिक डेवलपमेंट पीस एंड प्रॉस्पेरिटी इन दिस एपिसोड वी आर टेकिंग अप द थीम ऑफ इंडिया इमरजेंस एज अ लीडर इन द फील्ड ऑफ humanitarian assistance and disaster relief hadr over the years india has become a major responder to crises uh, whether they are natural or human made around the world with uh, great degree of uh, ability and competence and uh, also compassion and humanity so we are going to be discussing how india became a leader in hadr and uh, talking about uh, recent examples of how india has uh, become a friend in need uh for the whole world and to discuss this topic viewers uh, i have a very special guest uh, with me in the studio let me introduce you to him commodore anil jay singh mm -hmm. commodore anil jay singh uh is a veteran submarine officer of the indian navy uh he is vice president of the indian maritime foundation and a prominent commentator on uh, security issues so welcome to indian diplomacy commodore thank you very much professor thank you Commodore uh, HADR uh, is a field where India has really shown its metal and uh, over the years we have honed our capacities and have reached a stage where we can claim uh, with objective evidence that uh, India is a leader in this field and it's being acknowledged around the world and uh, so if you were to trace the journey back and see you know the major milestones and how we have become so good at uh, this rescue and relief and rehabilitation work around the world and what are the you know unique attributes that we uh, india brings to the table that makes us so special in this field i think at the very outset uh, our very civilizational ethos of india lends itself to this kind of a role as a as a force for global good uh, we know what the g20 uh, uh, theme is vasudeva kutumbakam uh, one world one family mm -hmm. so india at every stage i think has endeavored to uh, provide the world a, a favorable environment to be seen as a as a force for good and uh, that is perhaps even when india was economically not so not so, not as strong as it is today mm. we had just become independent and in the first two or three decades also we were always able to punch above our weight in organizations like the united nations when it came to initiatives promoting world peace mm. so i think that is part of our uh, ethos as a country uh, in so far as hadr uh, specific specifically we were constrained by our economic uh, you know we were not rich uh, we had capacity constraints we had capability constraints so we were always part of a larger un peacekeeping mission or a un uh, goodwill humanitarian mission and not doing very many things individually as a country mm. except in a immediate neighborhood I think the tsunami was really the coming of age of Indian HADR 2004 and the way the Indian Navy reacted or the government of India reacted I think that really st uh, uh, stamped our presence as a country that takes this role very seriously and a country that is developing the capacities and the capabilities to be able to uh, deliver when when uh, called upon to do so and that not only established our presence as a as a as a country which will always be available for providing humanitarian assistance but as a first responder Mm. I think that was the first time that we really were able to be first responders on a scale that was unparalleled at that time in magnitude by anything we had done before that. Yeah, uh, we, Sri Lanka, Maldives, uh, Indonesia, we covered all the affected countries during the tsunami. Despite the fact that we ourselves were, had been ravaged by the tsunami, we were able to send with by la, by noon that day, that very morning by noon, 21 ships, 15 helicopters and a few aircraft had already been dispatched and within the next 36 hours more than 30 ships uh and more than 35 aircraft with medical teams relief material etc had already been dispatched to all the countries you just mentioned besides offering assistance to chennai port, uh, the andaman nicobar island which had also been devastated by the tsunami so i think yeah. that really was won us a lot of international praise that was that was like a you know pivotal moment in the rise of india's hadr uh, that is correct yes missions and of course subsequently we have done many more uh, there was the libya operation 2011 uh there was the yemen uh, operation 2015 uh, operation rahat and uh, many other ever since covid-19 uh, crisis 
2021, we did many uh, operations and missions around the world. So uh, you can see how, and we obviously learn from the previous missions and then prepare for the next ones. And that's, I think, been part of the curve as we have progressed. That's correct. In fact, immediately after the uh, Boxing Day, uh, the tsunami was the, uh, uh, you know, the, the huge earthquake in Kashmir, where we extended so much aid to our Western neighbor, who still seemed hesitant about taking that aid at that time. But I think, yes, all the, all the events you mentioned, we have really grown as a, as a HADR power in the world, definitely. Mm. So viewers, uh, the thing is, India has uh, become a bigger player uh, from being a poor nation with a lot of goodwill. Uh, for the world and we always had right from the Korean War in the 1950s we have been involved in medical assistance and evacuation efforts and such things uh, around the world but uh, it's only in the last two decades where you can say uh, in the 21st century that India has really become a bigger player and uh, one of the most recent instances of this which we just saw um, is the devastating um, earthquake uh, that shattered uh, Turkey and Syria and uh, the Indian Operation Dost that was launched was on a scale and a magnitude that few could match around the world. It was one of the biggest missions, even though the ground zero of this disaster was 4,600 kilometers away from India. Still, uh, Indian Army and Air Force and uh, India's National Disaster uh, Response Force, all of them jointly uh, did this uh, Operation Dost. On this, uh, I have an interesting video uh, where Indian Army officers uh, who have been involved in this are talking about how they did it and uh, what they gained, uh, what the local people gained from India's contributions. Let's uh, watch them and continue the discussion. moment for us to hear about this disaster but uh, uh, we were uh, told to uh, be ready for mobilization and within uh, six hours we were at the airport ready to move in. Uh, 60 Parafield Hospital is part of 15 Indian Para Brigade which is the first respondent for any international disaster scenario. So our team consists of 96 persons in total and uh, we have uh, orthopedic specialists with us, surgeons, GI surgeons, maxillofacial surgeons to take care of multi-trauma cases that are expected in such a disaster scenario. I must mention that uh, the people of Turkey, that they are very strong-hearted and uh, the community spirit that they have. A lot of volunteers have just poured in from all corners of the country and uh, they are providing interpreters, uh, interns, nurses, pharmacists, doctors, whatever is required to run a facility like this. So I'm thankful to uh, the people, local people also, and uh, I salute their spirit. Uh, I can see it in their eyes, even if they are not expressed in the language that we understand, that they are grateful for the services that we are providing to them. It is very obvious in their eyes when I look into them. I'm really grateful to them because they are the first group you know arrived in Iskenderun and uh, with a group of army with a group of people and they actually arrived in Adana Havalimanı first which is a province in Turkey and we met them there actually it was sudden random thing because uh, I'm a group of uh, rescue team actually we help team in the field with the translation so, viewers, you just got a glimpse of the extraordinary effort that India made uh, at a time of deep crisis. Uh, Prime Minister Narendra Modi said we will do everything possible to save lives and to help uh, rebuild the shattered uh, societies of Turkey and uh, Syria. Uh, Commodore, we just saw Operation Dost uh, and just the speed with which we did it and you were all also talking about the swiftness. That is one of the speciality of Indian HADR. Uh, despite the distance, a uh, few hours, the way we mobilized and we had a complete um, 
you know, field hospital that we transported. So Indian Air Force, Army, all of them doing this together, together with uh, some of our paramilitary forces who are part of the NDRF. Now this kind of mission, it's complex and the number of teams that we fielded across uh, Turkey and Syria was uh, showed the scale also, you know, so both in speed and scale, this seems like one of the, our best missions and it's been widely appreciated. So your thoughts on how this happens and, you, you know, why is it that India is able to do it while many other developing countries of the similar, you know, scale, uh, uh, level of uh, development and capacities are not, you know, so clearly I think we are better prepared for these and uh, how, 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 have been, how have we been, you know, acing this so much? I think three or four things come to mind when you, when you see this, uh, this particular operation that India mounted, this HADR operation. Firstly is, I think one of the best things that India could have done was institutionalizing the entire HADR mechanism in the country by, by passing the NDM, the National Disaster Management Act, followed by the setting up of the National Disaster Management Authority, mm -hmm. followed by the National Defense Management, National Disaster Management Policy, followed by National Disaster Management Plan, which was first came out in 2016, then was again revised in 2019. So it's moving with the times, it's moving with India's capacities, it's moving ahead with uh, what are the sort of global responses required. So that is one aspect of it. You know, in fact, the Global Disaster Management Plan, the 2016 plan, was the first and the only plan in the world mm. which was in conformance with the Sandia framework of the United Nations mm. in terms of disaster management. So I think that in itself was, a, was one aspect. So when you have this sort of an institutionalized mechanism and you exercise it over the years with multiple agencies involved, you build up efficiencies, you streamline your procedures. And I think more than that was one part of it. The mm. second part is India over the years has developed the capacities. Till a few years ago, we wouldn't have been able to airlift so much uh, so far away. Now we've got the C-17s, we've got the Hercules. Master, Hercules, yeah. We've got all these aircraft, which we've got strategic airlift capability. We have strategic sea lift capability if required. Uh, the way we were able to put the NDRF, the Army, the Air Force all together in a very coordinated manner. All these speak volumes for the, for the understanding of HADR as a concept and mm. understanding HADR operations and executing them efficiently. This the 60 field hospital, the 60 para field hospital. I mean, they transported a whole hospital. Yeah. And I think another salient aspect of most Indian HADR operations over the years in various countries has been, we have never sought any help from the country we've gone to assist. Mm. We go fully self-sufficient and fully prepared to set up whatever is required to be set up to provide that kind of aid. Yeah, that they have so many burdens already. We wouldn't want the local administration to have to take care of us. There's a lot of so-called uh, disaster uh, tourism that many countries and NGOs and all of them do, and they actually become uh, part of the problem rather than, rather than part of the solution during humanitarian disasters. But India, you are saying, actually, we go self-sufficient and do not rely on the hosts, and they appreciate it because we don't want to uh, magnify their problem. They're already dealing with a massive, you know, um, human human toll and suffering. As the colonel said in this in the in the in the video, they went with everything. They went with generators. They went with operating tables, they went with operational operating machinery, everything they took with them. Mm. They did not need to resort to Turkish help to set up a field hospital there. So I think that's another great salient point of India's HADR initiatives. The third, of course, is it's, it, it reflects India's soft power diplomacy. I think it's very important. Uh, we know we've not, we've had differences with Turkey over the years on various issues. Uh, we'll put all that behind us. Mm. When humanitarian assistance was required, we were right there. And I think it's won the appreciation of the Turkish people. Most important, our initiatives mainly win the appreciation of the people. Not so much, I mean, the governments, of course, do appreciate it. But at the grassroots level, even the people appreciate it. It happened to the tsunami, and it happened now. If you remember, there was a photograph which went viral on social media, on the press, where this Turkish lady is embracing the Indian lady doctor. Yes. I think that picture Army speaks... Medical Corps, yeah. Yeah, that yeah. picture doesn't speak a thousand words. I think it speaks a million words about, mm -hmm. about India's efforts being appreciated. So I think all these factors have... Uh, brought India to the forefront of providing, of delivering public goods. And, you know, even the foreign minister, when he speaks about these things, he's always, he always emphasizes the fact that India takes this as a very serious responsibility. Mm. India does not take this lightly, this particular role that India is expected to play on the world stage. And I think it is, it is extremely important. I mean, I don't know whether it's true, but I did read in some newspaper that Pakistan refused permission for these aircraft to fly over its airspace mm. when they were headed to Turkey. I mean, that's very petty. That's petty yeah. And that seems, you know, that shows a sort of difference there is between a global approach, a big power approach, 
and you know uh, a small Arrow power Arrow kind Arrow. of yeah. trying to get a brownie point here or there very much and um, commodore you were you know you've been in the navy and uh, armed forces generally they are trained to defend the borders and uh, you know maritime spaces and to uh, you know fight the adversaries right uh, but here HADR, it's a completely different ball game uh, where there's nobody to fight uh, in the sense there's no enemy, but rather a lot of people to help. So uh, when armed forces, our armed forces prepare for these through training and through joint exercises with other countries and uh, the doctrinal and the conceptual developments and all these things you're talking about, the practices, uh, how do you make a soldier become a nurse and and do this you know caring stuff when the soldier is supposed to actually fight and you know and 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 and, and to hit back at the adversary so isn't that also an adjustment our forces do uh, or how do we manage these two contradictions or seeming contradictions yes it things? does it does because uh, as you said armed forces are meant to fight but you know over the years the focus from interstate conflict has slowly shifted to a lot of non traditional conflicts or non traditional security challenges and each one of these, even, even, even natural disasters, are actually a security challenge in a way. Mm. Because it makes a country vulnerable to inimical forces. It makes a, it makes a disaffected population. I mean, if you really see the, the root cause of piracy was uh, people being deprived of their livelihoods because mm. of uh, illegal fishing. And so it, they're all interconnected. So you can't take an, a non-traditional threat in isolation and say, we are only preparing for this. You have to look at the entire gamut of activity. And I think HADR becomes a very important part of that. The world has recognized it. Mm. Uh, the Quad uh, had a, signed an HADR agreement just last year in November. It's become a part of maintaining a rules-based order at sea and a free and open Indo-Pacific. Uh, it's a common pillar both with the Indo-Pacific Oceans Initiative and the ASEAN outlook on the Indo-Pacific. There are four common features. One of them is disaster risk reduction and, and uh, risk mitigation. And now, as, as, uh, as uh, the non-traditional challenge is evolving, mm. Non-traditional countering non-traditional threats has become a part of all major exercises. Mm. Even exercises like uh, Malabar, yes. which are which are purely navy, navy, and nothing else, have an HADR element in it. Army exercises have an uh, HADR element element Correct. in it. Correct. Uh, India itself conducted a HADR exercise just last year called Samanvay 2022, and that's where the defense minister made a very pointed statement saying that India has shifted its focus from being a relief-centric HADR uh, approach. Mm to a multi-pronged, multi-agency approach to prevent, mitigate, and uh, respond. So it's not just about responding now. We mm. are becoming proactive in ensuring that uh, we don't reach that stage where a disaster of this magnitude uh, happens or affects people. More proactive. So I think over the years, HADR is going to become more and more important. Mm. Uh, climate change is showing us the, the fury of nature and the vagaries of nature and, and what all damage it can do. And I think for a country like India, it's very important that this element, you know, we are now, we have become the voice of the global south. And I think to be able to champion the cause of the small island developing states, yes. all, of whom, all of whom are threatened with inundation if the sea levels rise, we have to become their champion and reflect their position on the global stage. And, and in fact, uh, viewers, uh, Prime Minister Narendra Modi has announced uh, um, uh, an initiative uh, to provide medical uh, relief supplies to all developing countries which are in crisis and humanitarian. And this is going to be our Maitri, uh, long-term, uh, you know, Maitri agenda uh, going forward. So on this, uh, we did exemplary work uh, with HADR during the COVID-19 pandemic. And we was, uh, Indian Navy undertook uh, Mission Sagar, uh, which is to support uh, littoral countries in the Indian Ocean region with uh, essential medicines and food. Uh, let's. Uh, Watch this video from the Indian Navy and continue the discussion.
is uh, stirring uh, scenes of Indian Navy uh, helping uh, countries that are in a uh, deep crisis during the first wave of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, Commodore, uh, Indian Navy in the IOR region, first responder. And uh, we have cemented this position and uh, our ability to reach so many corners, both the western and the eastern end of the Indian Ocean, and to coordinate with so many countries, our Ministry of External Affairs, the diplomats are involved, armed forces are involved, civilian administration on both sides are involved. These are complex operations. And uh, at the time of the pandemic, when you know countries were shutting down borders and uh, movement uh, on maritime spaces had almost come to zero, this was a big crisis. And we stepped up and uh, through you know, Mission Sagar and our uh, Operation Maitri and all these things. So um, how you know, have the, has a Navy risen to this level? And you've seen it over the years. And there are many other missions apart from this uh, in recent times. Um, you know, if there was a cyclone off the coast of Mozambique, the Navy is there, uh, Madagascar, you know, Sri Lanka, wherever there is calamity, India is there. And uh, that too in timely fashion. So you've seen this evolve. So your thoughts on how we have developed uh, in this field? Again, it comes to a, a question of capacities. Uh, Indian Navy has always been at the forefront in delivering assistance whenever required. If it, earlier, it used to be Bangladesh or perhaps Sri Lanka or in our, in our neighborhood. As the capacities increased, we've got bigger ships, we've got an LPD, we've got, uh, we've got uh, uh, large LSTs as, as you saw, INS Kesri. They are able to carry a lot more aid, they're able to carry more disaster relief. But after tsunami, uh, every Indian naval ship that sails carries disaster relief equipment on board. Mm. It has become a standard operating procedure across the Navy. Over the years, uh, this has evolved. Uh, the Navy started doing something called uh, mission-based deployments, that it, which means that at any given time, there are 12 to 15 Indian naval ships deployed in various parts of the Indo-Pacific who are not only carrying out whatever they're supposed to do, the, their primary role of, uh, of exercising yeah. in security, but they're also able to therefore become the first responders when a situation develops. Yes. And this, I think, has really uh, enhanced our capability to offer assistance. Uh, when the when the cyclone hit, uh, I think in Mozambique. Yeah, Ida. Exactly. Arawat was right there. Yeah, she was the first ship to reach there. And we repurposed the mission because we were <coughs> we doing other mission. training exercises yes. there. And the ship was already carrying relief supplies. Yeah. So it didn't even need to come back to a harbor to to take anything or or, or or load up. It just was there. So I think that has made a lot of difference to the way the Indian Navy approaches it. Mission Sagar, of course, was a very very sort of uh, focused mission. Uh, I think India's COVID diplomacy, as we call it, has been a great success all over the world. Uh, not only in terms of distributing vaccines, but in terms of food relief, uh, etc. When uh, when, Maldi when the Maldivians desalination plant packed up, it was India which supplied drinking water to a whole country. Yes. And that, that was all carried on Indian naval ships. So I think the Navy has got a very important role to play because for two reasons. One, of course, is the fact that unlike land borders, there are no maritime borders. Every country with a coastline is a maritime neighbor. Mm. Uh, so that is one. The second thing is, as a it is a it is a major strategic outreach in a way also because at sea a situation can develop so fast and even if it's developing many hundreds of miles away from your own shores it could reach there very fast mm. we saw with piracy we've seen it happen over the years so the very fact that we have ships all over on mission based deployments doing this keeping uh, we are supporting uh, capacity building in all these countries it's not just about providing assistance yeah. it's about capacity building for them to be able to assist Cope themselves with calamities, yeah, to give them that sort of support yeah. So this gives you the kind of uh, strategic leverage, in a way, in a nice way, not in a not in a coercive way, but in a in a more benign way, Absolutely. to be able to shape the maritime neighborhood, to be able to shape the maritime space in our area of primary interest. India is the preeminent maritime power in the Indian Ocean. It has to at all times maintain a favorable maritime situation, and be a force for good in the region and for the region. Absolutely. And I think that is the bedrock of Prime Minister Modi's. Sagar Doctrine, which should not be uh, confused with this Mission Sagar, which is security and growth, growth for all in the region. Absolutely. <coughs> so viewers, um, Commodore Anil Jaising says that uh, this is also strategic and indeed humanitarian relief. Uh, we do it uh, selflessly uh, because every life matters and uh, we have the ethos of Vasudev Kutumakam, but also uh, in key regions of the world where India has a primary interest 
and uh, which uh, fall within uh, Indian sphere of influence. Uh, India has to be the first responder and it is doing so uh, with uh, great prowess. Uh, I want to thank uh, Commodore Anil Jai Singh for wonderful insights. Uh, thank you, Commodore, for sharing so much with the audience. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Thank you. So, viewers, uh, India has emerged as a leader in HADR and uh, India is also training fellow developing countries in HADR practices, meaning that we don't believe in a monopoly. We believe that uh, the, do, the good things that we do should be widely known and uh, can be replicated. And I think uh, there's no greater example of a good global citizen than India when it comes to uh, humanitarian disasters and crisis. So do think about India as um, you know, a friend in need and which makes India so reliable, trustworthy and uh, wanted by so many players around the world. It enhances our soft power as well. So uh, do focus on the HADR uh, capabilities of India and how they bring all our abilities into one prism and make the world sit up and say, here is a leader. I'll see you again next time. Until then, take care.